Okay, we'll try that again. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the October 3rd meeting of the City Council Committee on City Services. Um, just want to announce real quick that this meeting and all who are in it are being audio and video recorded. Um, and we'll begin um, with a roll call. Laura, would you um, call the roll? Sure. Um, Councillor Foster. Here. Councillor Gore. Here. Councillor Labarge. Here. And Councillor Perry. Here. Okay. Thank you. We're all here. Or the four members of the committee are here. Um, and what I'm going to do is our committee has um, a couple of items we absolutely have to take up today and a hard stop at 615 due to another city council committee meeting. Um, so what, what I'm going to ask is for the public comment, which is a third on the agenda, I'm going to ask if you have a comment um, or a question that's related to our roundtable discussion on the impact of retail marijuana sales and city services, please hold your comment until after the departmental presentations and a chance for city councilors um, to ask questions and engage. Um, because that way we make sure that while our department heads are here, we're able to um, talk with them, give them time to present and share their information. Um, at 545 at the absolute latest, we'll have to move on to our other city council agenda items. So then we'll sort of know um, how much time we have left. And um, if this discussion needs continuation, it, it can be um, continued with the council um, you know, at a future meeting. Um, so with that said, is there anybody who has a public comment that is not related to an item on the agenda tonight? Okay, great, thanks everyone. Um, then we also don't have, Laura, am I correct? We don't have minutes to approve today, right? That's correct. Okay, then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, our plan was a round table discussion. Um, Thank you so much, Chief Casper, for being here. Um, do I see Commissioner O'Leary yet? I have not seen her. I was trying to make her co-host. Okay, um, and th that's okay. I know that there are a couple of folks here with Commissioner O'Leary. Can you just let me know um, so I know who, I, who I'm looking for? Um, if you could maybe raise your virtual hand if you're here. Okay, or your actual hand. So I see um, Kiko and Kara. Is there anybody else that I should be looking for? Okay, great, thank you. Um, oh, and there's Commissioner O'Leary. So why don't we do this to give her a chance? Um, Chief Casper, are, are you willing to go first? And I don't know, we, we did submit some questions ahead of time if you had a chance to look at those, um, but if you have some information you'd like to share and then we'll have a chance for counselors to ask you questions. And then Commissioner O'Leary and the other folks from Health and Human Services will give you that same chance. Sure, I'd be great. happy to. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Um, so I thought I would just start with just a you know a quick overview of where we all started when adult use marijuana entered our city, and of course when the Netta facility opened up, um, you know down off of Con Street, and I think immediately when it opened it became clear it, it was a very busy site with lots of vehicle traffic, and we had some accidents with lots of pedestrian traffic. We suddenly had concerns around lighting, making sure people were crossing safely, all those sorts of things. And I know that Netta experienced, um, you know, having thousands of customers uh, per day uh, coming to the center. Uh, but of course, as time has gone on, and, and you know, at that time also, we had officers that were there all the hours that it was open. Um, not that we required that in any way, but Netta had asked for that. So we had people down there to help mitigate some of these issues. Um, but you know, time has passed and more facilities have opened, more sites have opened. Other states around us are beginning to go through their own legalization process. So we have experienced, uh, uh, observed, uh, less customers go into Netta, and we certainly don't have the same kinds of traffic via pedestrian or vehicle challenges down in that area that we had when it opened. And I know I watched over these last few years, I know we've all watched together as new sites have opened. A lot of them have hired officers, put up big grand opening signs and all that, and then you drive by a grand opening and they're actually pr pretty mellow uh, openings, <laughs> pretty, pretty quiet, not as much as they had expected. So I think that initial opening that we had and what happened with that I don't anticipate that continuing to happen as, as new sites open up. 
So I thought, thought I would just give that background to understand that we certainly did have issues down there. Netta was good to work with. All the surrounding businesses were great, uh, but we're not having those problems around parking and uh, traffic as we did when it opened. So uh, now, you know, nowadays we have a lot of sites in our community. I know there was a recent article uh, in the paper about the number of sites that we have. And myself or one of the captains as required by the CCC has gone through those sites prior to opening, looked at their security, met their folks. Um, and those have really all been fine. It's been smooth sailing with those opening up. Uh, I did pull the data. I knew this group would be interested to know kind of, do we have a lot of calls there? Is it uh, something very different than other sorts of sites? And the short answer is no. That's just, I can leave it at that. I, I can answer more questions if you have it, but we really just don't have anything going on at these facilities. They're equivalent to any, any sort of store that would open. So occasionally alarms go off, um, there's medicals, there's things that happen at places where there's people. So we're not having anything specific related to the fact that it is a marijuana facility. Um, they're generally quiet. We haven't had violent crimes in the parking lots. I know prior to um, legalization, that was one of the things that was concerning, looking at the data coming out of the other end of the country, states that had already legalized, had had reports of people you know, carrying large amounts of cash and people being targeted. We haven't had that happen here uh, that's been reported to the police department. So overall, you know, our assessment of these sites is that, that nothing particularly of note is going on there that's not going on anywhere else. So that's the site data. And then uh, as far as OUI drugs, OUI operating under the influence, you know, we have two types. You have OUI alcohol and OUI drugs. This is a percentage that has gone up quite a bit over the last few years. I've reported this out at Transportation and Parking Commission before. I can give you the data. I have that in front of me. Uh, so in 2019, it was 5.4% of the OUIs that we had were OUI drugs. In 2020, it was 9.8% of the, of the OUI cases were OUI drugs. In 2021, it was 22.2%. So we've seen a dramatic increase and I'm just gonna put a caveat on that. So the actual numbers that we're talking about in 2019, we had six. In 2020, we had six, and in 2021, we had 14. So those are very small numbers to work with. And when we're looking at data, I like to be cautious about working with such small numbers. You know, it, it's, they're small numbers. Uh, also, when we learned that marijuana was gonna be in our community, it was going to be legalized, we have officers that are trained as drug recognition experts, DREs, and we're better at detecting, apprehending, and, and now ultimately charging folks um, with OUI drugs. So I wanna put all that out there. So it's hard to know, did we have a lot of it going on before and we just didn't have the capacity and, and you know laws to be able to do that? I, I can't really speak to that. It appears we have had DRE since 2019 and that data that I gave you is from 2019 to now. So it appears at a higher percentage you know, it is going up as far as the percentage of OUI operators, um, but I'm cautious uh, with those numbers. The other question you may have, well, if it's OUI drugs, is it all marijuana? The answer to that is no. Um, it's mixed drugs. A lot of times people are under multiple, under the influence of multiple substances that may include alcohol, marijuana, prescription medications, other drugs. And quite honestly, just to be frank, it's just easiest to charge someone with OUI alcohol because we have a really clear law on it, right? You all probably know it's 0.08 uh, and that's measurable and easy. With marijuana, we're just not in that world yet. Uh, we have other tools that we use to assess impairment and then we have tests we give to assess what you're impaired by. But as far as how much should be in your system or could be in your system and you could still, um, you know, operate safely, I would argue zero, but that's me, um, hence my position and my job in the city. Um, so we don't have that number yet. So if you have an officer who's out on the street and pulls someone over and there's pot in the car that's been consumed or is, smells like burning marijuana and the person has also consumed alcohol, we're probably going to make the arrest in charge with the alcohol because it's more measurable. So our officers are definitely seeing multiple substances, roadside, 
prescription meds being right up there as well. I don't want to overlook that and say that that's not part of this. It absolutely is. Prescription meds are, we deal with them quite a bit um, being misused. So that's the, the drug data on OUIs. And then the last thing I would say, and I mean, I think you, you would all know this from you know, walking around our community is that definitely there's been a huge increase in public consumption. Um, it's, you go to you know, the park or downtown or lots of locations and just it smells like pot. Um, it, the odor lasts in the air quite a long time. So if someone smokes and then you know, they're not there anymore, it still lingers in the air for a while. So we definitely, I'm sure many people in here have noticed that out in the community that you smell pot a lot more than you used to. Um, and that is certainly the case here. And while that is um, not legal to publicly consume marijuana, there's really no teeth behind the law. There's really no consequences for it. So it's not really an enforceable uh, offense. So those are a brief summary of you know, my thoughts on these different areas of um, marijuana, the presence of marijuana and where we are from where we were when NETA first opened a few years ago. Thank you, Chief Casper. Um, what I'd like to do is, are you able to stay with us till 5.30, 5.45? Yes. Okay, great. So what I'd like to do is give counselors um, a chance if they have initial questions for you and then move on to Commissioner O'Leary and then a chance for additional questions. And um, if anybody's like me, they'll think of them um, over the next few minutes. So um, counselors, do you have questions for Chief Casper to start with? Yeah, I do. Okay, Councilor LaBarge. Yes, thank you. Um, Chief Casper, you're absolutely correct about smelling pot down in the center of Northampton and at the park. There's no question about it. I have residents who tell me how bad it is, and it is bad. I, I'm, I'm a, I cannot believe that it's not an enforceable offense with somebody smoking marijuana. And then I'm hearing you say, that alcohol is a bigger problem than marijuana. If somebody is driving a vehicle and they're smoking pot, they don't get stopped for that, but for alcohol, correct? No, I mean, they would be stopped for impaired, impaired operation if they did something that attracts, say they steer over the marked lanes or they're in a motor vehicle accident or they do something that draws the attention of an officer. Um, so then the officer approaches and can smell whatever's coming out of the car. That may be alcohol, that may be marijuana, it may be both. It's just, there is a very clear, measurable way to say you are operating under the influence of alcohol because the law says 0.08 in your, in your body, that, that's it. You're over the legal limit, you're, you're driving OUI alcohol. It's not the same for marijuana and drugs. There's not a I, I can't measure a 0.08 or a 300 or whatever the number would be for marijuana. We don't have that test yet. There's lots of science folks out there trying to figure it out, trying to determine um, how you could measure it. I've heard it compared to trying to find a drop of water in a swimming pool, like trying to measure um, essentially marijuana in folks. So the science just hasn't come along on that yet. Okay, another question I have. In 2018, when it came forth on capping for the marijuana dispensaries, at that point, a good percentage of the counselors had great concerns about not enough of research on it. Now there's a tremendous amount of research out there of our young children who are taking marijuana. There's great concerns. We had Dr. Johnson do an excellent, excellent presentation about marijuana and our students here in the city of Northampton. And even with Meredith O'Leary, I had talked with her about a month, month and a half ago. And she mentioned about how it was brought forth in 2018. That's the past, now it's now. Now it's now, and it is a problem. There's no question about it. It's like, we have a lot of dispensaries coming in and I'm very surprised with an email every one of us counselors got today about one of our agencies, and especially who is an owner who handles mental health conditions, 
and who also is an owner of a dispensary in our city. I find that very difficult for me of hearing something like that. My main concern is wipe out 2018, it's 2022. We have right now 12 dispensaries in this city and it's our job to protect, just like yours, Chief Casper, correct? Of protecting our community, everybody in our community. And I, I, I just feel that it is probably time now to cap. That's my feelings about it because of all the dispensaries coming in. Council Labarge, I just want to make sure that other councilors have a chance for yeah, questions okay. before we yes. deliberate as well. Did, did you have any other questions? For no, Chief that's Casper? fine. That's fine. All right. Did you have any other questions for Chief Casper? No, uh, uh, Councilor Gore, Councilor um, Perry. Okay, Chief, I have one one more question for you as well, and that was you touched on um, uh, traffic stops and operating under the influence. But I'm I don't know if if the data could be pulled to show if there's a role and how it compares um, in other types of calls you get. Um, I'm thinking calls that you know maybe public disputes or or domestic violence or something like that. Um, if you're seeing a role of alcohol in that, as well as if you're seeing a role of cannabis in, in, in those calls, or if you separate it out, or, or if it would just be anecdotal. It would be anecdotal. It, I don't have a good way to search clean data to provide you on that. I mean, it would be a matter of like searching certain words and, all, and that never works. It, it never gives you good data that's reliable. Okay, thanks. Oh, that's so nice. Okay. Oh, yeah, what's um, birthday? And uh, does Councillor uh, Councilor Nash, you have a question? Come join yeah, us. Yes, so I just have a question, which uh, for Chief Casper, um, it, it, how are we, tra how do, oh, I always call them DUIs, because <laughs> I guess I'm old school, OUI. Old school. <laughs> yeah, that, um, so, what are the what are the overall numbers for 2019, 2020, and 2022? What are the trends we're seeing there? Are they going up or down? So it's really tricky to look at data right now with COVID. So I can yes. tell you that I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, although they are on our website. But what I recall is that I believe we're at like 110 of OUIs total. That's drugs and alcohol prior to COVID. And then all the bars closed and everyone stayed inside and people weren't out as much. So our numbers went way down to maybe around 50 or 60. Again, it's on our site, but this is roughly. So we saw a huge decrease in, um, in OUI. Uh, but now we're starting to see the numbers uh, pick back up again as things open back up again. Right. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions for Chief Casper? Okay. So what I'd like to do then is move on. Um, Commissioner O'Leary and um, Kara McLaughlin and Kiko Malin, I hope I said your name right. Um, I know you had some information to share with us. We'll give folks a chance to, to ask you questions as well. And Laura, can we make Kara and Kiko co-hosts if they're not already? Sure. They're co-hosts. Thanks. Okay, so you, you can go ahead and unmute yourselves when needed. Thank you. Hi, counselors. Hello, everyone. Hello. I love your blouse, your sweater. I'm admiring <laughs> it too. <laughs> Spreading some love today. Um, thank you for inviting us here today to talk about uh, capping and marijuana and the impacts. Um, we appreciate the time and I brought along my team with me which we'll introduce after I give an opening statement. But, um, so let me start off. You know, as we all know, this is uh, not negotiable. We're not disputing this. Cannabis among our youth and young adults is a major public health concern. Early youth cannabis, cannabis use is associated with neuropsychological, neurodevelopmental decline, poor school performance, increased school dropout rates, increased risk for psychi uh, psychotic disorders in adulthood, increased risk for later depression, suicide, suicidal ide ideation, and or behaviors. Because of these impacts, the state sets environmental strategies or policies to help prevent use among youth. 
such as regulating the price of marijuana products, such as where products are sold, the products themselves, or the promoting and advertising of products. These state policies are a broadcast net to help protect the youth. State legalization does not necessarily result in uniform community environments that regulate regulation cannabis markets. We as public health leaders, we as policymakers, and those that know our communities best, we're given the authority to make stricter policy than that of the state if needed. But even more importantly, our community, our community members really rely on us to do this. For my 18 years in public health, I've played whack-a-mole with the tobacco industry. You've all seen this play out. Uh, for 18 years, about every other year, I've had to make tobacco regulations to undo the harm of big tobacco marketing tactics of sweet, cheap, and easy to get. Local laws and ordinances that govern our city can have a direct effect on the youth's ability to access these uh, to access substances. Local laws have an important role in determining, uh, determining our health. We have evidence-based data that shows communities that have high numbers of fast food restaurants and tobacco retailers are linked with poor health outcomes in their residents. This is fact. We have evidence, we have data. I'm asking this committee to learn from what we know. Because, uh, because cannabis has not been legalized long enough, there's not a lot of data available as to show how cannabis will affect our retail, excuse me, retail cannabis will affect our youth. Um, excuse me. So what I really wanna do is present to you today a little information that we have based on other substances, meaning tobacco and alcohol. So retail density, you might hear that a lot today. Retail density acts as a measure of concentration of retail cannabis that's available in our community. We know that based off tobacco history, that tobacco retail density is associated with youth initiation exper and experimentation of tobacco products. The higher retail density contributes to uptake of youth smoking and youth initiation. Um, there has been a study done that, uh, that I found done by the Rand Co uh, Corporation that shows as marijuana outlets open after the drug is legalized, the density of those recreational retail or retailers is associated with more use and greater intensity of use among young adults, according to this RAND Corporation study. RAND Corporation is a research organization that develops solutions to public policy changes to help make communities throughout the world safer, more secure, and healthier. This study is amongst one of the first to examine associations between the density of marijuana outlets and marijuana use over time. And I'd be happy to show this study with you. Also, we know that retail density and proximity also influence social norms. We've all heard about social norms throughout the years. In tobacco, retail density alongside the widespread advertisement and availability normalizes the presence and use of tobacco in our communities such that people think it's common and acceptable to smoke. Marketing strategies by big tobacco companies help create the impression that tobacco is normal. This is a type of normalization advertising that can work to undermine all the work that we do in public health to help people quit um, to, you know, it helps keep current users addicted, helps attract new, years, new users. The abundance of tobacco and nicotine products can perpetuate the norm that most people smoke, even when smoking rates are declining, so that has an opposite effect. I'm asking council today to think about our built environment and learn from previous experiences with substances in our, substances in our community and asking you to consider a cap. Capping retail permits, capping limits, or reducing the number of retail licenses that are available in any given, given municipality is a long-term strategy that we have used to reduce retail density and exposure to the substance, whether it be tobacco or cannabis, as well as marketing. We're being given the opportunity right now to hit the pause button until more data comes out. What would be a real shame is if we don't hit the pause button now and we have to play whack-a-mole with cannabis as we've had to do with tobacco. So I'm, I'm, consider, I'm asking you today to really kind of consider if you're not going to move forward with putting a cap, perhaps maybe, maybe just this pause, a moratorium on adding more 
permits or licenses in the cannabis uh, retailers right now. So with that being said, what I'd like to do next is have uh, Kiko Malin, who is our Substance Use Prevention Director, and Kara McLaughlin, who is the Northampton uh, Prevention Coordinator who deals with youth, give you some uh, data and information specifically to some of the questions that you had asked uh, the counselors to submit beforehand. So Kiko, if you'd like to go next and give a statement, that would be great. Thank you, Commissioner O'Leary, and hello, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting us to present. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, okay. Um, and I, so my name is Kiko Malin. I am newly hired. I'm almost three months on the job now, I think, as the prevention team director and also the director of public health excellence for the Northampton Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so in my role as prevention team director, I manage all of our substance use prevention programs, which includes Hampshire Hope, some of you have probably heard of that. It's our um, opioid prevention coalition, um, Hampshire County wide. We also have the DART program, Drug Addiction Recovery Team, which is a public safety, um, public health partnership to prevent opioid overdoses. And then as Commissioner O'Leary mentioned, the Northampton Prevention Coalition, which Kara McLaughlin leads, and you'll hear from her a bit later. Um, and then in my public health excellence role, it's about uh, regional infrastructure building for public health. So those are my hats. And in my presentation here, I'm really gonna serve as sort of a link between what Commissioner O'Leary just said and what Kara is going to present partially because I'm new and I'm just getting up to speed on all of this. I have a lot of experience in public health, but my background is not so much in <laughs> substance use. So I have some skills that are very relevant to this work, but I'm learning about the data. Um, but I do want to just underscore what Commissioner O'Leary said about the pause, because I think what we're going to talk to you about, talk to you today about is just our concern about the connection between outlet density and youth use. And we do have local data that we wanna share with you about that. Um, and just with the burgeoning, the mushrooming, shall we say, of, of um, cannabis outlets, it's, it's a concern that we, and we don't have all the data. We have some data and Kara will be telling you about what we have and what we don't yet have. But what we do have indicates enough of a concerning trend that it feels very important to slow down. So that's really, I think, our main message. Um, I want to start by saying, in response to your request for data, um, we do not have a lot of local data about adult use. Um, we're well aware of anecdotal data about the benefits of cannabis, you know, legalization that's made um, access to cannabis easier for people who suffer from chronic pain or have certain medical conditions. We hear those stories, but we don't have data to support that. We also don't have a lot of local data about adult use in general. Um, we're definitely aware of national data that shows that um, in addition to making cannabis this more available, the legalization of recreational cannabis use in the country as a whole has substantially reduced the price of cannabis and increased its potency, which is really key. Um, it's also contributing nationally to an increase in emergency department attendance and hospitalizations for some cannabis related harms. And we also know that the use of high potency cannabis is linked to particularly negative outcomes, such as dependence, psychosis, and structural brain changes. And as Commissioner O'Leary mentioned, this is particularly relevant to adolescents. Um, I think most of us know that adolescence is actually a longer period than maybe we might think. It's not, it doesn't end at 19. Adolescence sort of stretches to 25 or 26 years old. And it's during that time that the brain is developing. So from sort of 14 to 26, there's a lot of brain development that's happening. Um, and some parts of the brain, in particular, the prefrontal motor cortex. And I see there's a physician on the line who probably knows this stuff way better than I do. So I'll just say um, that the prefrontal cortex does not fully develop until one is 25 or 30 years old. And those are the areas of the brain that are associated with decision making and impulse control. And so using heavy high potency marijuana during the time that the brain is developing can definitely contribute to structural changes that can be that can have lifelong impact. Um, and also adolescents are at greater risk for developing addiction to drugs or alcohol if they use heavily during that time period because of increased um, neurobiological based tendencies for risk taking with decreased regulatory control, you know, moving away appropriately from parents, making decisions on their own. All of these can factors kind of conflate to, con to contribute to a very vulnerable time um, in terms of the impact of substance use on the adolescent brain. 
So given the biological reality of the susceptibility of the adolescent brain, as public health experts, we are most concerned about the impact of the normalization of cannabis use, which is exemplified by the growing number of outlets in our community um, on our young people, as Commissioner O'Leary said. Um, we also have concerns, as we do with so many public health issues, about how the adverse effects of cannabis use may be disproportionately affecting certain groups, such as LGBTQ youth or youth of color. Um, we do, as I mentioned, have recent local data about cannabis attitudes, beliefs, and use among Northampton youth. And we also have, fortunate to have with us um, as a city employee, Carol McLaughlin, who is a prevention specialist. She leads the Northampton Prevention Coalition, partners very closely with the schools, and brings together teachers, students, and other stakeholders to understand the current picture of substance use among our young people and to engage in upstream prevention strategies that are looking at the root causes of why people might use substances in the first place that are harm reduction focused and that are, are student centered. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kara to give some more, a deeper, closer look at what we're seeing with our young people. Go ahead, Kara. Thank you, Kiko, and thank you, Meredith. And thanks city councilors. It's always so strange presenting in a room by myself to a group of people who I don't really know um, very well. So um, forgive me if I'm, I'm stumbling a little. Um, so thank, thanks for having us. I think it's a really important decision. I'm grateful that you all invited us here to have a conversation about how we're seeing it impact our community. And I wanna echo what Meredith and Kiko has said is that we don't have huge data sets on how it's affecting all of Northampton, but we have this really, really amazing rich data that um, our sister coalition, SPIFI, collects on our local youth. And we can compare that not just to the Hampshire County, we can compare that to the region and the state and nationally. Um, so we know a lot, prevention science has come a really long way. I mean, even that word is a new word for people, but it's called prevention science. And people often think of DARE, that didn't have any science in it. That's pre-science um, prevention. We have this large body of work that really helps us to understand. Um, am I able to share my slides and try? You should be able to as a co-host. Great, I have some slides to share and I wanna really um, do a shout out to Carolyn Johnson um, from the Spiffy Coalition who has a PhD in um, evaluation and data science. We're so lucky to have her in our community to speak really um, fluently and wisely about um, this data set that we have. Um, most communities don't have an epidemiologist in them to, to use as a resource. So I'm gonna start our slides. So many of you have seen these slides in a different version from Caroline, and I took them to kind of hone in on uh, the, what specifically in Northampton, um, how we've been seeing it, it roll out here for mostly for young people. Okay, so again, this is like a community health and primary prevention. That's the language we use in public health is primary prevention. So it's before youth ever use ever starts. And we use this public health impact pyramid of like when you're looking at interventions, if you look down below, the biggest thing that's gonna make a health impact is socioeconomic factors. And then on top, counseling and education is making the least amount, the smallest impact. Um, and the this second to bottom one, changing the context, that's about policy and changes. So things like tobacco taxes or the, the drinking age of alcohol. Karen, I see someone's hands raised. I'm, I'm assuming I should just keep going or is that someone from city council that has a clarifying question for me? Oh, thanks. Yes, um, keep going. And members of the public will have time after presentation up until about 5.45. Um, okay, so yeah, we'll Tracy, if you have out. questions for me, I'm really happy, but I prefer to keep going so I don't get distracted. So just like put a pin in on your question for me, if it is for me. All right. Um, so this is this is this bottom tier is like a lot of the, the where we're looking at 
um, the impact. And right now, this is the conversation you all are having about cannabis caps, about how it's going to impact. It's going to have a really large impact rather than the, um, I just for giggles put this in, <laughs> old McGrath just say no drugs is, is, is out. And we really go at deep research and science. Um, and as Kiko talked um, quite a bit about, and Meredith as well, so we're really concerned about brain development. And so cannabis caps don't always relate, you might not think relate, but we're gonna show you how they connect and how we've learned how they connect. And as um, Kiko said, this is a picture I couldn't quite, it's not formatting well, but it shows the maturation of the human brain from age five to 20. And the blueing is showing you when the brain is becoming fully matured. And before that, um, we know that there's lack of impulse control and also habit forming. There's a lot of neuro um, pathways being created and what's, what young people do are what habits that form and things they're not doing get pruned out. So it's really important what's happening during these adolescent years. So now let's focus a little bit on our Massachusetts and local data, data on teen cannabis use. move my slides around, hold on a second. I can read everything. So this is concerning to us. The cannabis is the number one reason that 12 to 17 year olds receive treatment for substance addiction in the state. Do not wanna gloss over this. It's even though alcohol is the most widely used substance still, and that number is closing quickly amongst adolescents, Cannabis is by far the primary reason. They may have other um, co-occurring disorders, but cannabis is listed as first. And that's 60% of young people who go into treatment list cannabis as their first um, reason for going in. And if you add it as a secondary, that number jumps and tertiary as well. And then we also know that poison control for young people, so that we know that we've allowed um, cannabis um, the industry will often talk about how they're highly regulated, but they're still allowed to make their products look like candy. And you can see that in our local industry are selling products that look like candy, including um, gummy bear like items. And that is often what um, the edibles are what's causing overdoses and poison control. Here's a, the data on a slide to show this. So there's a 240% increase in the number of calls to poison control for six to 19 year olds. And 20 fold specifically for edibles. Okay, so more Massachusetts data. This is the graph of the data I was showing earlier. Sorry. Okay, and then here's the eight percentage um, increase since legalization. Now let's talk locally. So, so I know you're all interested in seeing what's happening locally. So 40% of the students who are using are reporting that they're having um, acute negative consequences. This includes extreme confusion or anxiety, elevated heart rate, hallucinations or nausea or vomiting. This is self-reported data from the, this, um, it's called the Prevention Needs Assessment Survey that's given annually. And also local pediatricians have noted the high prevalence of cannabis hyper, hyper mimesis, I'm still learning how to say that word, I only read it, um, which is this can be um, uncontrolled vomiting and um, that parents are reporting is happening locally with their young, their young people as well as pediatricians. So building up what Chief Casper said, this is about driving under the influence of cannabis. We've done a really good job in public health of helping young people know we don't drive drunk or drive under the influence of alcohol. And that's what you can see in this data slide. But you can also see that they are choosing to drive while, while high. 
while under the influence of cannabis. And we don't have a way to measure that. Um, and then also driving in a car with, with an adult or another person that's high is also, is also quite high. Reason I'm pausing is as I'm thinking about, um, as, as some of you may know, um, this past August, the state legislator passed um, recent legislation to allow for the um, on-premise cannabis use sites. So that will be coming, I would say, in the next couple of years that we'll be having on-premise. So cannabis cafes in town. And so this idea of people driving intoxicated, we expect to, to see an increase as well. So density is a big thing. So this has a lot to do with the cap conversation you're having. And that some people have made this argument that um, Great Barrington, for example, has higher um, outlet density as Northampton does. Um, so you can see how on the right-hand side, it's this, these circles represent, let's just say a community of the same exact size with the same amount of stores. But depending on where these stores are located and the houses are located, young people may, may not interface with the stores very often. But when you have a community similar to our downtown where they're so, they might be really close, and in fact, we know they're close, they're interfacing with the cannabis retail stores much more often. So proximity matters, how, prop, how close these young people are to the cannabis stores. So academic research consistently shows the closer youth and young adults live to outlets where alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis products are sold, the more likely they are to not only use, but to use more heavily. Which when we think about adolescent use, it's not just frequency, it's how much, and with high potency um, marijuana, it's extremely concerning. In New Hampshire County, we're seeing the more adult use cannabis retailers, middle and high schoolers report are within a 10 minute drive of where they live, the greater their own cannabis 30 day uses. So this is specifically about 30 day use and edible um, use rates. So it's among students in districts in Hampshire County where there are five or more adult use retailers versus districts where there's fewer than five retailers. So you can see there's a marketable increase. So say South Badly, for example, has no zero um, cannabis stores allowed. Um, Amherst, I believe has eight, East Hampton has six, the closer the youth are. So in Northampton, we chose, we, we've allowed youth to be very close to high numbers of cannabis retail shops. Okay, talking about potency a little bit. So about 50% of Hampshire County teens who have ever used cannabis report having little to no awareness of how much THC is in the cannabis they use. So is it a 10% or 15% or some of um, the high, most average are going into the 20s and 30s and um, there is medical cannabis that is available. That's 99% THC for medical reasons. So it can really span and they may not know how much they're ingesting and how, if, how much they ingest. So this is the, the slide in a graph form. And then nearly 60% of the teen users who are aware of that code, how much the potency is, they're reporting they're using 20% or higher. And just to compare it in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, it was about five to 7% potency is what was common when most um, of the older adults were teens, what, what we're using comparatively to now. We also see as an equity issue that LG B, not T, but LGB youth, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual youth are using at much higher rates. And this is Hampshire County data. And here's those, this is the last two slides is what I really wanna hone in on. So we compared Northampton to, the, the, to Hampshire County. 
So the percent of teen cannabis users report that legalization has made it a lot or a little easier to get each type of cannabis product. They're saying a marketable increase, Northampton use, then countywide use. And on this next slide is the same as a similar percentage of teens, regardless of whether they use cannabis or not, report that legalization has made them a little or a lot, lot more likely to use cannabis. So you're seeing in Northampton, young people are around more cannabis shops, they use more cannabis. Um, so I just want to, that's the end of the slides that I have. Um, and I just want to point out a couple of things. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, just have to remember that when we're thinking about a cannabis cap, it's on dispensaries that won't affect on-premise sites. So soon we'll be also having on-premise sites as well as dispensaries. And um, there is no reason to believe there will not be um, a continued ballooning of cannabis. I think there's people arguing that there'll be some cannibalistic behaviors. We have not seen that with alcohol or tobacco. We've just seen it continue to grow and grow. So if we look at how many alcohol, alcohol retailers and on-premise and off-premise for alcohol there are, the numbers are large. And we should expect that it will continue to grow our cannabis. Um, okay, that's it for me. I'm really open to hearing um, thoughts and questions. Thank you. Um... Kara and Kiko and Commissioner O'Leary. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, have a chance for, for counselors to ask clarifying questions. And as I'd mentioned up until about 4, 5.45 and then we, we do have to consider other matters before another committee meeting tonight. So I'm gonna do my best to give as many people a chance as I can. Um, so counselors, what I'd like to do is have time for questions um, either from the Health and Human Services team or Chief Casper. Um, and we'll save sort of commentary or deliberation for, for another meeting, but while we have them here, I want to make sure we are able to learn from their expertise and, and ask them questions. Um, so with that being said, I will entertain questions from counselors. And that includes, um, this meeting was double posted, so counselors who are not on the committee, if you also would like a chance um, to ask questions, um, please feel free to raise your hand. And Tracy, just because I'm easily confused, I'm going to lower your hand for now, but when we go back to um, members of the public, feel free to re-raise it. Um, so I'm gonna to go to Councillor Gore and then Councillor Labarge. Um, so this is a question for um, Commissioner O'Leary. Um, so right now, cannabis isn't really advertised as much as tobacco, um, but do you think that, um, Retail density is a form of advertising, especially to young people. Hi, thank you. Yeah, great question. So this the CCC has a regulation around advertising, but we've seen there it be a very slippery slope and really not enforced, which is um, kind of disheartening because I think in 2018, when we were really kind of looking at this and city council was talking about that, we were we were relying not only on the state's regulation, but enforcement thereof. Um, I've seen on multiple occasions um, advertising that doesn't conform to the CCC's regulation, which is the Cannabis Control Commission, their regulation. And I've actually um, notified them of such advertisements. They've been on billboards, they've been in newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, so what's being done to control that is out of our hands, unfortunately. Um, so, but, you know, the you're not allowed to use certain language when you're advertising or marketing your store, but you know, that is the word marijuana or the showing of a pot leaf, but there it's really, there's some gray area in there and they're doing some things, which I think are, you know, skirting the regulations and really because we have, you know, especially in some of our uh, downtown areas have huge, um, retail density compared to 
you know, the square mileage that you can't even walk a block without seeing for uh, marijuana, recreational marijuana establishments on, you know, on one block corner, on one block's corner. And just because they're not using the word marijuana doesn't mean that what they are using for their marketing, uh, marketing strategy, it implies that it is marijuana just because they're using different language or different verbiage people still know, youth still know that this is a cannabis shop. And that again, goes to social norming. It normalizes that this is okay, even though they're, they're not using the word marijuana as you're not allowed to by CCC regulation. Thank you. I have one on the other question. Um, so if, you know, cannabis shops have all these regulations, like you have to have an ID to, get in and all that, where do you think the youth are getting more cannabis from? Like there, there's more cannabis use, but where do you think they're getting it from? Right, so um, we actually looked into, we wanted to see if youth compliance checks were being done in the state and they weren't, they didn't have that data available to give to us. Nowhere on the um, CCC, website or speaking with representatives from the CCC, could they give me data on youth compliance checks? So I asked them, is it just not made available to the public? Are they not being done? So we really don't know what's happening. I do know anecdotally, just from having three children myself, one of them in college, that um, they are purchasing in recreational marijuana shops. I don't know how that's happening because as I read the regulations as I've talked to Chief Casper, it's like there's vaults to get inside and there's policy. You have to show an ID to get into the staging area that which then you know you have to show ID again to get into the next staging area. I don't know how it's happening and I don't have data to present. I just have anecdotally youth saying that they you know have gone into adult recreational shops, but I have nothing solid to give to you on that. I don't know where it's coming from. Kara, did you want to add to that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I see Dr. Carolyn Johnson's on the call who is, they ask these questions on the prevention needs assessment. So if it's okay with you, Meredith and Karen, we can check in with her around the teen health survey data and also Heather Warner's here as well from Spiffy. Um, but I, I, I can say that I do know that social access is the biggest way they get, um, that they get cannabis and it's a small percentage of going actually into stores. Um, Heather, uh, is it Carolyn, sorry, Car Karen, is it okay if we ask Dr. Um, Dr. Johnson to add anything to that since she's here and they're the experts mm -hmm. on the data? Yes, that. That works for me. Um, Carolyn, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you if you have more to add there, um, specifically around the question of where youth are yeah, accessing. Or, and, yeah. and or Heather, yeah. Or Heather too, yep. Sure, thanks. Um, so according to our most recent iteration of the Prevention Needs Assessment Survey, which uh, students completed in spring of 2022, um, the majority of youth are getting it from their friends. 65% are getting it from their friends. Um, a, a little over 20% are getting it from strangers. 20% uh, are getting it from family members. And um, about 2% report buying it at a store by themselves. And again, this is self-report. Um, from students themselves. And we also asked teens where the weed they use originates from. And 45% across countywide said that it originated from a licensed dispensary. About a quarter said it was uh, their weed came from a homegrown plant. 22% uh, said it came from an unlicensed dealer, and 20% uh, said they didn't know where it came from. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Councilor Gore, did that answer your question or did you have a follow-up? Yeah, that answered my question. Thank you. Okay, oh, great. I see Councilor Nash's hand. Um, before I go to you, Councilor Nash, I just want to double check um, Councilor Perry or Councilor Labarge if, if you had follow-up questions. Nope, I have to say that <clears throat> Councilor Jamila 
score answered one of my important questions was about our youths going into or are they going into the dispensaries? And I, if I can recall, when Dr. Um, Johnson had spoke at, at Community Resources, she did mention something to the effect where some of them were saying they were going into dispensaries. So I want to thank you for that very, very much. Thanks, if Councilor Barge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Just is it okay if I just touch on what Councilor yeah. Barge said? Yeah. So you know, um, we're in the age of the internet, and if you just Google right now, um, fake IDs, they're they're not hard to get. So we're not um, claiming that cannabis industries are letting in it. We have no way of knowing. The Cannabis Control Commission is in charge of checking to make sure we don't have local local recourse. The police department. And ourselves will not be doing any what's called retail like compliance checks to make sure they're doing the right thing. That is not up and running quite yet. We anticipate that happening like we do with alcohol and, and nicotine, but that isn't possible right now. So we're just in the dark seeing that teenagers are saying they're actually able to get in and we don't know how, whether that's borrowing an ID or getting a fake ID. Okay, thanks. Uh, so now we'll go to Councillor Nash and then Councillor Mayori. Uh, but first, Councillor Nash, welcome again. Thank you. Here, let me get my hand down here. Okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, I actually can pr provide, I think, one way that um, younger folks are getting into dispensaries, and it has to do with getting medical cards that uh, youth with medical cards are allowed to, uh, if they're under 18, they can go into a dispensary to uh, that's selling, that has, can sell medical marijuana if they're uh, accompanied by their parent. Youth who are over 18, but under 21, can, have, can get a medical card and, and enter a dispensary. Uh, just like any other adult, to get medical marijuana. They can't do adult use, but I, I, I do know that it, uh, you know, Meredith was mentioning how youth get, um, you know, can get in. And one of the ways is for somebody over 18 to get a medical marijuana card. And that um, I think those are pretty easy to acquire. And so that that is one loophole uh, for ways uh, for people to get in. Because I, I th there was a number of like 12% of NPS youth that was presented for uh, community resources um, had said that they'd been in dispensaries. And, and that one kind of blew my mind because I, it's really difficult to get into a dispensary without showing ID repeatedly. But that is that is the legal way for youth to get in. And it also uh, suggests that also that there are parents out there who are, you know, seeing, you know, for their children that possibly mar medical marijuana is a way to address anxiety and other issues that they might have um, in, in the same way that adults are using it. So I, I, I so that number, um, I think it needs to be explored more. I, I really doubt based on um, you know, through the many years that I've gone through, uh, you know, the how we've rolled out cannabis here, that a lot of kids are getting into these dispensaries. They are deathly afraid of being shut down in that way. So, I, but I just wanted to put that out there. I, I, so in terms of questions, all right, <laughs> that um, I, I'd like to know. Um, what the the numbers are that we've seen for Northampton youth over the last um, since since we've opened up that I'd like to know the youth numbers have they gone up or have they gone down and there is also a comparison to Northampton youth using more marijuana than Hadley youth based on a that we have retailers now and you know that. I'm I'm just wondering if we have data that goes back prior to adult use that could also show that Northampton youth probably used cannabis more than South Hadley youth four or five years ago, and that I I 
you know, I I, th I think we need to be careful about um, uh, this is a new industry. And as the person who supported and sponsored the cap four years ago that got voted down, um, I, 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 I agree we need to be careful. But I, I think, you know, I, I'd like to see those two those pieces of data, you know, if we're making a comparison that are we seeing a trend or are we just comparing numbers right now? And also if there, I, I, I would like to see the, the numbers for cannabis youth over the last four years for uh, Northampton youth. Um, and that's what I got. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Um, DHHS folks, um, do you have answers um, or thoughts about that? I'm sorry, I didn't have my camera on. How rude. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Meredith and Kiko, are you okay if I, if I answer this one or do you want to jump in first? Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, th thanks, Councillor Nash, for your questions. I think they're really important ones. Um, per the first with medical uh, marijuana cards, um, I'm pretty sure Caroline Johnson presented this previously that it's a small number of youth in Massachusetts have medical marijuana cards legally. So um, was it 1% Caroline that have medical marijuana cards that, so it was, it wasn't, it didn't line up is what I'm trying to, trying to allude to. Is that right, Caroline? Do you want to add anything to that? I think, I think it was less than 1% of the general population, not just youth specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, without check, like fact checking that one, maybe with local uh, medical marijuana doctors, um, I I'm not sure we can make the jump either way about that one. Um, and sorry, did you want to say something more? Yeah, I just want to say I, I agree. It's it's kind of an unknown. We don't know the answer to it. Mm -hmm. um, it it is is it's an outlier to look at. So yeah, it was it was surprising to us as well. So um, South Hadley, um, per South Hadley, per comparatively to Northampton um, youth. So I think what was happening when I was saying is it's students who live within driving distance in Hampshire County. It's just not just Northampton youth that we were talking about. So we went going back to the slides and thinking about <laughs> who lives in proximity to the stores is using more. So we weren't even using Northampton versus um, South Hadley. It could be South Hadley use that might be close to East Hampton or Holyoke lines. I don't, well, it wouldn't be because that would be um, Hamden County. But um, Caroline, again, or Heather, do you want to jump in on this and, and explain that data point that you had? So uh, the 12%. The yeah. No, no. Uh, uh, Councillor Nash was saying, like, were we comparing Northampton use rates oh. with South Hadley use rates? And the, what we were talking about was in proximity to multiple stores, because this is about a cap, the question, right, of like, how it would a cap make a difference to how many, um, like, how many youth, young people are close to stores and the number of stores they have increases the likelihood that the youth living near those stores increases regardless if they're in Northampton or East Hampton or Hadley. Is that right, Caroline? And do you want to add to that? It's right in that we are talking about the data is uh, Hampshire countywide. So the more dispensaries youth report living by, um, the more likely they themselves are to use and to use more. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure I'm quite understanding everything you're saying, Kara. I'm yeah. so sorry about that. No, that's okay. And I, I think the questions Councillor Nash is asking about the last slides about youth in Northampton reporting more use, I think your questions are, is that the same as previous to the stores opening or not? I'll also add that we just, I mean, there's just been an ex like a huge increase of stores opening in Northampton. So we haven't we haven't even captured the data since it's opened. We captured the data in um, spring of late winter of 2021 when those stores weren't open yet, and um, not all those stores were open yet. And the year before was 2020, and they're all connected to a pandemic. So what 
what the message from my perspective is, is we even haven't even seen how this is impacting our young people yet with just this many stores that we have and that we anticipate because the more normalization, because the more stores, we anticipate there'll be increase, an increase in use. And Jim, to answer your question, we can we can go back and look at the data over the years. That's something that you know I can't answer on the spot because I don't have it in front of me. But we certainly have the data and can look into it and and get back to you and everyone here about that. Um, I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that. That would be great. Yeah. And also the 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 use rates that Spiffy monitors annually. I'd, I'd like to see what those are since 2018. I know that the pandemic has probably impacted, um, you know, when the, the schools were pretty much shut down, that it would have been difficult. But for, you know, during the times when it's been open, I, I think it'd be really helpful to get those numbers. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, I, I agree, Jim. We, um, we, you know, I think that what we, you know, one hesitation we had of just presenting it point blank, but I think as long as we can have a conversation about it, is that, you know, we we are seeing that use rates during over COVID went down for a lot of grade levels and across the nation, because a lot of access to alcohol, we saw dips, huge declines in alcohol use, in cannabis use, in vaping, and during COVID. And part of it is because social access is such a key piece of that. And then post, you know, COVID, we were, we, you know, when schools were back in session, we saw things rising and we saw this nationally too, but it hasn't rebounded to where it was pre-COVID. And so in some ways it's like the story just, we don't have enough trend data since COVID to really understand what what is happening. And I think our 2023 data will really reveal more about what direction things are going. I would love it if the pandemic somehow interrupted a trend and, you know, helped young people become less, you know, likely to use all kinds of substances. That would be awesome. I, I don't know what to expect going forward, but I, you know, we, that we just can't say yet. We don't have the trend yet again, post pandemic. So that's kind of where we're at, but we're happy to share that data and um, just knowing that you can't, you know, you have to, you can't separate the pandemic from, you know, kind of what we're seeing. But you expect to have numbers for 2022, 2023, by when? Well, we survey in 2023 in the spring. So, you know. And you have 2022 numbers, correct? Yeah, we have 2022, okay. yeah. And 2021, you know, again, the even in 2022, we saw some rebound, but I don't think we're we're at where we may end up, you know, in 2023. But so it's it's hard to make conclusions about it based on, um, you know, the 2022 rates. But it's yeah. So we'll, we'll see. Again, I'm, I'd be, and and the other thing I guess I just want to add is that despite the fact that it has that we haven't seen a full rebound we are seeing that young people are using um, higher potency products and more heavily. So I think there's still a dedicated group that are, you know, finding access and, and using. All right, I'd like to jump ahead to Councillor Mayor. You've been very patient. Go ahead. Are you, oh, my screen jumped. Let me unmute you. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Councillor. I'm going to try to sneak in two questions, but I'll do it smoothly so you don't notice. The first question I was uh, thinking maybe for Commissioner O'Leary, um, which is how do you have a number in mind in, in terms of capping and how would, and or how would council or how would you suggest council come up with that number? And the second question, uh, would be for perhaps Chief Casper or you as well, Commissioner, which is, I would love some clarification about the school zone. We heard it was reduced, the school zone in terms of retail, marijuana retail. And I, I just wanna understand, you know, if it was reduced and why, what was the thinking for that? Thank you. Hi, great questions, Councillor. 
So I don't, I mean, numbers, I feel at this point are arbitrary because we're way past the number that I recommended in 2018. Um, in 2018, I think I was asking council to cap around uh, six at that point. And again, that number was arbitrary too. I just felt like we had an opportunity to just kind of go real slow and see what was going to happen. Um, at this point, you know, um, I think even the counselors that were part of the conversation in 2018 never thought we would be seeing um, possibly 13, 14, 15 establishments. We really thought that the market would kind of dictate it and keep the numbers a lot lower than where we're at now. That still might happen. We are, I feel, what I would call oversaturated in this market. And I don't, um, you know, just by observation, I'm not sure that they can sustain with this many out there. But all of the communities in Massachusetts that don't have an outright prohibition of these types of establishments, the ones that I could find that do allow them have a cap on them. They have a maximum limit on how many um, can be in their community. So it wouldn't be fair to me to pick that number. I wouldn't want to say, you know, let's reduce it below. I don't know how many host agreements are out there. This is a very, um, you know, it's a very complex decision that you have to make if you're going to cap it where that's going to be. But it, it's definitely more than I would, I recommended four years ago. And did we get the second half of your question, Councillor Maori? Did, did you wanna, oh, you're still muted. Hang on. Oh, am I on mute? Yes, I am. Yeah. Well, I guess you couldn't pass the buck over to Commissioner O'Leary to do my homework. So anyway, <laughs> the second part of my question was, um, uh, was about the school zone, which Councilors have been told it was reduced. I think a lot of us on council have been there just one or two terms. So I, I don't, I'd like to, you know, if there's some history to that or some clarification sure. about this idea of the school zone. What, what, what is the purpose of the school zone? Why would it have been reduced if it was reduced? And that's why I thought maybe either Chief Casper or the commissioner would know that. Sure. Um, I, I can just give a little, a little bit um, to this topic. When I presented in 2018, I was asking for a 500 foot buffer from an establishment medical and or recreational to a school zone. And I presented you with some GIS mapping that kind of uh, mapped everything out. I also asked for where children congregated and it was very kind of difficult based off from, you know, um, uh, just as the crow flies, like the places that they'd be kind of limited to were like in the industrial section of Northampton or way out in Florence. It was very kind of tricky. Um, so the the buffer zone was kind of just um, not negotiable at that time. So we were really kind of emphasizing at least the cap. But I do believe that the state has in their regulation that it has to be a 200 foot buffer zone from um, any school, higher education and or um, K through 12. Mm -hmm. At preschool. Oh, I get it. So, so what happened was it kind of just defaulted to the state standards, and your suggestion of a higher amount, you know, just it wasn't taken up. Is that what happened? I, I think it proved to be difficult. Right, because of yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And just, just you know, because this is a public meeting, maybe you could comment on what the school zone provides. You know, why that's a thing. For, for people out there who are. Yeah, sure. uh, Chief, do you want to jump in here? Did you yeah. have anything before I do, Chief Casper? I mean, the original intent of school zones and, and drug sales really, you know, goes back to, I, I, I don't want to give you the wrong decade, but I recall that law from the 80s and 90s because, of course, kids were being targeted, similar to when Commissioner O'Leary talked about tobacco sales. Um, narcotics sales and drug sales, marijuana, other sorts of drugs were targeting children. And there was a recognition by people who were illegally uh, dealing that this was an area to go to to get kids hooked on drugs, uh, right? There's no other way to say it. Uh, so laws have popped up that have provided this kind of zone of protection around school zones. So I think that's its kind of history and why it was created originally. And of course, many people here have spoken about um, you know, proximity of 
things to children and how that impacts them. So I certainly see the logic in continuing that kind of very important uh, component um, you know, of the of rules and regulations that are out there. Thank you so much. And thank you to you, uh, Chair, for, for letting me ask some questions. Thanks for being here. Uh, so I want to be mindful of the time. As I said at the, the start of the meeting, unfortunately, we have a, a hard stop for the, the whole committee meeting at 6.15 due to a second committee meeting after. Um, I trust our committee that we could condense um, our next work down a little bit. So that leaves us till about 5.55, which is not much time. So before um, you know, we take uh, questions or comments, I do want to say you can always reach um, all your city councilors by emailing us at citycouncilma.gov. Um, it's citycouncilma. Oh, I did not say that right. Let me try that again. City Council at northamptonma.gov. It's city council at northamptonma.gov. And that goes to Laura, our administrative assistant, and she forwards everything to all of the counselors. So you do have access to us. And um, this isn't the final word. And thank you for indulging us and in, in ensuring we had time to hear from um, Commissioner O'Leary and Chief Casper. What I'd like you to do, um, I see a couple of hands up. If you can limit your comments as much as possible, two minutes or so, um, please do so just so we can go through as many as possible. And unfortunately, I will have to stop this at 5.55 for the rest of the committee work. Um, so with that being said, um, uh, Ananda, I see your hand and Tracy and Michaels. Um, so we'll start with Ananda. Did, if I said your name right, Ananda. Uh, close enough, Ananda. <laughs> um, I'll try to talk fast. I have a question and a comment. The comment I just wanted to share, um, so I live in Leeds, but I used to do the Northampton Prevention Coalition in a previous career. And I did wanna say to Jim Nash's question about like, does Northampton just have a higher rate of, of pot use or acceptability? I do remember, and other people can clarify that across Hampshire County, um, there weren't huge variations. Like all of us coalition coordinators would be like, you having problems with vaping? Me too. <laughs> like there weren't huge variations in use. So that was just one comment. The question I have is I've been attending all of these meetings and I'm really bad with names. So the last time I attended, there was somebody who I think was the director of maybe CSO. And I think her name started with an S, um, but she had, I think it was the community resources meeting. And she had said, we haven't seen an uptick in any marijuana um, treatments, whatnot, da, 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 da. And my question is, does she deal with adults only? Because the slide they just showed about youth rates and the 64% that are like the main reason that kids are going for treatment is because of marijuana. I just wanted to know if, if those are in disagreement or if it's just that her agency deals with adults and the other data is dealing with um, youth. Sure, I think I, I wanna hesitate to speak for, or to speak on behalf of, of somebody who, who we didn't invite to this meeting. Oh, I guess so, I just want to know yeah. if it's an adult agency, because I don't know. Um, I, I'm not, I, I believe they serve primarily adults. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the Prevention Coalition is focusing on youth data. So they're, they're likely, or potentially that could explain, explain a okay. difference there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then I just wanted to lend my support to the CAPS. I do think that the public health model makes sense. And I think that uh, Commissioner O'Leary already has a big battle with tobacco and alcohol and everything else. And if we could just do this in a slow, mindful manner, it would probably be good. So thank you so much. Thanks, Ananda. Um, Tracy, thanks for your patience, Tracy. Um, You're unmuted, so you can go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I just have to say that I raised my hand when I did, so I'd have the earliest opportunity to comment, but I did understand your rules at the beginning. Um, as to the constant comparison of pot use to alcohol use, um, I enjoy the taste of a glass of wine. My husband likes a cold beer on a hot day. I can have one glass of wine and he can have one cold beer. And this does not really affect us, but people smoke pot specifically to get high so this is very different. Um, that constant comparison to alcohol really doesn't stand. And the reckless proliferation of pot shops in our city concerns me for several reasons. 
Chief Casper has acknowledged that we do not currently have a way to assess how much marijuana is too much when it comes to operating a vehicle. It was a hasty decision by the state of Mass to legalize marijuana use before we had a scientific method for determining a level of incapacity. Why can't Northampton be cautious just because of this? The chief also reported that the OUI drug stops have more than doubled from 2020 to 2021, going from 9.8 to 22.2 percent. And yes, COVID had an impact, but the pre-COVID percentage in 2019 was only 5.4 percent. That number also doubled in 2020. Marijuana order odor perfuses the air in downtown Northampton. Secondhand smoke from cigarettes was deemed evil and unfair to non-smokers, and that smoke doesn't get non-smokers high. Why is secondhand smoke from marijuana okay? Why can't we enact and enforce a restriction on this exposure? If Northampton decides to allow pot cafes, how do we protect employees that work at these cafes? How can we allow smoking dope in a public venue affecting employees but not allow smoking cigarettes? It doesn't make any sense. Please pay attention to the data presented by Kara McLaughlin. It is imperative and very important. And I do have some anecdotal data about cannabis use among our youth. I work with a young guy in his early 30s. I'll call him Ted. He's been smoking pot since his teens. He says he can't leave it alone. He says he's addicted and so are his friends. He says he wished he never smoked pot to begin with because when he, when, he, when he doesn't smoke, he feels like part of him is missing. He says he has no hope of ever living his dreams and he mostly can't remember what they were. Kara McLaughlin has shown that with rates among youth cannabis use, proximity matters. If the pot shop at the center of Florence where dozens of our local kids congregate becomes a reality, then how many Ted's or Mary's or David's lives will be changed forever? That's your responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And I see Michael and Lizzie, and we've got about two minutes left. So what I'd like to do is split the time, which I know is short, um, but Michael, if you wanted to make a quick comment, that'll um, leave room for Lizzie as well. So I ask you to unmute and yep. very briefly. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I'll be very, I'll be very brief. I'm not gonna go, so my name is Michael Willers. I'm a pediatric cardiologist. We've already heard um, from a lot of fine folks about the psychological and psychiatric um, dangers of marijuana among youth, which I see in my own practice. Um, even though I'm a cardi pediatric cardiologist, I see a lot of those psychological effects as well. What I wanted to touch on briefly is that it's not just psychological effects that marijuana has on people. There have been studies that have shown that smoking marijuana leads to the same cardiopulmonary damage that we see for tobacco. There, uh, we know vaping causes significant pulmonary injury. Um, we also know that marijuana can cause a uh, decrease in blood pressure and loss of consciousness. I see that quite a bit in my practice. And finally, there was a recent paper that was published in a, um, in a great cardiology journal that showed that use of marijuana increases the risk of cardiac arrhythmia that is um, abnormal and sometimes dangerous heart rhythms. So I just wanted to throw that out there at all. The, the damage is not just psychological, it's also physical. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, so Lizzie, we've got about a minute. I'm gonna give you a chance to unmute. Okay, um, I will be real quick and I apologize, I'm sick. My might be hard to understand me. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Lizzie and I'm a sober marijuana addict and um, the city council has been wonderful so far, but I wish more city politicians would be reaching out to the sober addicts in this community. There are thousands and thousands of us and we are suffering because of the concentration and saturation of dispensaries. Um, almost every AA meeting I go to, it's talked about um, whether these are addicts whose primary usage was marijuana like myself or alcoholics who secondarily used pot. They are struggling with their sobriety over the last four years because of how many dispensaries are in Northampton. And I never thought when I moved to the city so many years ago, I would feel like I was battling my own city government to protect my sobriety and the sobriety 
of my recovery community. And we are absolutely 100% under attack and we have everything to lose. Please consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie, and I hope you feel better. Um, okay, wow, what a cooperative group. Thank you all um, so much. It's um, unfortunately, we do have to get through a couple other things on the agenda. So I wanna thank um, Chief Casper, Commissioner O'Leary, um, Kiko Malin and Kara McLaughlin so much for your time and input to this discussion tonight. Um, I, I think we all had a chance to learn quite a bit. Um, so, so thank you uh, very much for being here and um, uh, remember to members of the public that did not get a chance um, to speak, you can email us at citycouncil at northamptonma.gov and thanks so much for understanding that. Um, so we're going to, I, it always feels a little anticlimactic because we just had this big discussion and we don't get to put a bow on it or wrap it up, but know that we've had the discussion and we've heard you, um, but we do need to move on to item six, which is um, items referred to committee. And so councilors, just for your knowledge, um, the committee on legislative matters has their meeting tonight. So my goal is to wrap up at 615 so that Laura gets a, the tiniest of breaks in between meetings um, for that. So uh, our presentations can be quite brief because we do also need to talk about um, vacancy on the community preservation committee. Uh, but we just have three vacancies. And first up, um, we have, um, we're on item A, 22.169, appointments to various committees um, for the Arts Council, Kay Carroll. Was, uh, was that you, Council Perry? That was me. Thank you. And I'll keep it brief. I had a lovely conversation with Kay. Um, you know, she's, she's excited to do some work with the Arts Council. Um, she's been traveling between Boston and Northampton for a bit. And when she decided that she was gonna really take roots here in Northampton, uh, she wanted to give back. She went to PVPA. So she does have a history in, in the arts. She considers herself a professional dabbler, as they say. Uh, and she, she went to school for music business. So she's really excited to use her talents uh, on the administrative side as well uh, as her love of the arts to give back. With that being said, I would give her a positive recommendation or make a motion for a positive recommendation. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion made by Councillor Perry and seconded by Councillor Gore. Um, Laura, could you do a roll call please? <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, wait. Is there any discussion on that motion? Okay, then Laura, you can do a roll call. Councillor <laughs> Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Great, so that passes um, with four votes. Thank you, Councillor Perry. And then we have the Conservation Commission, um, the application of David Reckow of 45 High Street in Florence. Yeah, that was me. I, I interviewed David. Um, he uh, worked at a water quality specialist. Um, he was on the board of Public Works for 15 years. Um, he worked at UMass and researched the quality of service waters um, and where he applied for various types of um, use of the Mill River. Councilor Gore, I'm sorry, we're having a really hard time oh. hearing you. I don't know if you can. Um, I can get a little closer. Oh, if that yes, helps. that's fabulous. Um, Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Um, he's, he's lived in Novo for uh, since 1985. He lives in Florence Center. Um, he, he really loves Northampton and the open land, and he's looking forward to um, working on the commission and overseeing the wetlands. And um, he has a lot of knowledge of health systems of wastewater and drinking water and knowledge of infrastructure. Um, he has a love of nature, um, camping and bird watching. Um, so I would give him a positive recommendation for the Conservation Commission. Okay, motion for a positive recommendation made by Councilor Gore. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilor Labarge. And is there any discussion on that motion? Okay, thanks, Councilor Gore. Um, Laura, could you do a roll call, please? Councilor Labarge. Yes. Um, Councilor Gore. <coughs> yes. Councilor Perry. Yes. And Councilor Foster. Yes. So that motion uh, passes with four votes. And um, finally, that leaves us with the Board of Registrars, the application of 
Mary Lou Stewart of Florence, and this is to fill a vacancy for a Republican Party member to this board. And Councilor Labarge, you had a chance to speak with her? Yes, thank you. Um, I had a nice talk with Mary Lou Stewart, and it was amazing when she told me her husband was Dr. Jay Flightman, which I know very, very well. She, Mary had told me that she's approaching her retirement soon from the Hilltown Community Health Center, and she would like to be more involved with local government. She would like to be on the Board of Registers as she is interested in assuring that the elections are safe and fair. And she's asking us to thank us and thank and look at her consideration of being on the board. So I move to forward the recommendation of Mary Lou Stewart to the Board of Registers with a positive recommendation to full city council. I'll second that. Okay, motion made by Councilor Labarge and seconded by Councilor Perry. Any discussion on that motion? Okay, Laura, could you do a roll call, please? <laughs> Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Gore. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. And Councilor Perry. Yes. Okay, so that motion passes with four votes. And that brings us up to uh, item B, 22.174, appointment to fill vacancy and elected position on the Community Preservation Committee. This was referred by City Council. Um, and so just by quick note of history on this, um, this is an elected position on the Community Preservation Committee uh, with a resignation because the member has moved out of Northampton. And so that left a vacancy and under our city charter, um, it is City Council's authority to fill that vacancy just until the next election. So that will be a year from November, um, the person would be serving. Um, I wasn't entirely sure how this process would go down with our committee, not knowing how many applications we would get. Um, so there were a, a different ways we could have uh, looked at filling this vacancy, um, but because we ended up with just three applications, um, rather than bring people into the committee meeting, which could be pretty awkward, um, I can give you the lowdown on how those applications <laughs> went. Um, so one of our applicants, uh, which is former Ward 2 City Councilor Dennis Bidwell, um, applied and you'll see his, uh, ap his application was forwarded, um, but he withdrew his name after realizing he'd have conflicts with a number of the meetings. Um, so that left us two applicants. Um, so what I can do is report back on my conversation. Um, I do have a recommendation, but it's just a recommendation after after speaking with both applicants. So it's it's really uh, for committee conversation and, and uh, for us to make a recommendation as a group of four. Um, the first person um, I spoke with was um, Jonah Zuckerman. And um, Jonah applied, um, he's had served on the Arts Council years ago. Um, he's trained in um, architecture um, he has a, a history in the arts and historic preservation, as well as personal history in um, outdoor recreation and open space. Um, you know, he's he's really interested in the conversation about what you know what the funds could be used for. Um, very invested in, in affordable housing, as well as that conversation about what is a public good um, for for those tax monies. Um, you know, he he described himself as having a weird resume. I thought it was actually a very funny resume. Um, he mentioned that he has over the years made too much art, given it to family. Um, he's kind of jumped around quite a bit um, and he felt like it didn't quite represent all of his interests and yet he actually has very broad interests in all of these um, uh, topics that the CPC studies. Um, you know, when I asked him why he wanted to serve um, he said that he's been really wanting to contribute to the city in a meaningful way for a while and has just been kind of trying to find what that niche may be. Um, his wife is a former school committee member, so he didn't consider running for one of the elected CPC positions, um, you know, because she was running for school committee. She's no longer on the committees, which kind of opened up that, that avenue, as well as um, he closed um, his own business um, doing furniture making. Uh, to go back to social work school, which has kind of changed his own 
availability. Um, so he's interested, uh, he's available for the meetings um, and has really been wanting to contribute meaningfully for a while. Um, and I did speak with Brian Adams, who's the chair of um, the CPC about sort of um, what might be the most meaningful to the committee. And he said he felt like um, somebody with a, a jack of all trades background to say, or a Jill of all trades, um, you know, that because the CPC has these different focus areas, um, that was something meaningful um, to the chair of, of the CPC. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. So that was Jonah Zuckerman. The other person I um, interviewed was Lynette Abney, um, who she moved to town about a year ago to live closer to her adult son. Um, Lynette is, um, has been on the other side of the table as a, um, you know, an applicant to CPC fund or CPA funds in her previous committee uh, community. Um, you know, she's just really interested in community building um, and historic pres preservation. Um, you know, and, and what kinds of projects might make the city one um, where people want to visit and where uh, different age groups uh, are reflected. She has experience and interest in carpentry, carpentry um, you know, as, as well as, as very much um, just invested in, um, you know, what's going on in the community. She lives in Laurel Park and shared that she had recently worked to rewrite the bylaws um, in Laurel Park. Um, so with that, I think semantics wise, we need to have a motion for discussion. Um, so I would move um, a positive recommendation for Jonas Zuckerman as a city council appointee for the CPC, but that's just for purposes of discussion. Um, is there a second? No, I'll second that then. Okay, thanks, Councillor. <laughs> uh, so that gives us a chance to discuss uh, between those two applicants. I'm glad to, um, you know, answer questions or or hear more of your thoughts on that too. Councillor Councillor Barch. Are we under discussion now? Yeah, we're 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 under discussion or available for discussion. Yeah. Okay. I I was very impressed with um, Jenna Zuckerman of the degrees he had and the different types of work that he has done. And then I'm hearing from you, Councillor Karen Foster, that you talked with Brian Adams in regards to what he felt about a candidate. This is an elected position, correct? So yeah. he will serve this position if we vote on him up until the following next year of November, then it ends then because of an election, correct? The only thing, the only detail I'm not 100% certain is if it would end after the November election or in January, January when right. elected officials are sworn in. So I believe it would be January. Yep. Right. Okay. So I, I misspoke before. Well, I, I want to thank you for talking with Brian Adams, because I think that was good to hear from Brian exactly what he felt about having different types of backgrounds. And I agree with that. And just reading on, you know, Jonah Zuckman's background, I feel he's a good candidate. Thanks, Councillor. All right. Yeah, well, okay. I, I will, will say as well that A, I'm thankful that people are applying for this position. It's heartening to know that we just didn't have one uh, mm -hmm. person apply. Um, but I really do think that Jonah's uh, background knowledge in the city, his former experience in the Arts Council, and just his kind of breadth of knowledge will really be a boon while we wait to for someone to be elected. Um, and but I do hope that Lynette still, you know, <laughs> up, you know, wants to run and and see if you know they will be a part of it as well. But I, I think that your recommendation is the way to go. So thank you, Councillor Foster. Yeah, and I wanted to echo, I think that Lynette will have 
a lot to contribute to Northampton. Um, I think for this particular um, position, it felt like um, Mr. Zuckerman's background had a broader depth of experience and, and sort of knowledge of, of Northampton as, as we go. Um, Councilor DeGore, though, did I interrupt you? And I'm sorry if I, I did. Just, um, you were able to talk to the chair about um, Jonah, but were you able to talk to the chair about Lynette? I, um, thank you for asking or giving me a chance to clarify because I didn't say that super well. I talked with the chair before talking with either Jonah or Lynette. Oh, okay. um, so I didn't talk to him about specific applicants because that's really our purview to fill. Um, but I talked to him about what he felt would be most valuable to the to the committee. And that's when he said a, a sort of Jack or Jill of all trades. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I sort of muddied that in. Uh, Councilor Labarch. Yeah, I, I also want to state that I want to thank Lynette for putting in for this position and for her not to think that she's not capable of being on any board or committee in the city and for her to apply for another commission or committee or board. Thank you. And I, I told both candidates that I would um, follow up with them after the meeting. Um, so that can be conveyed. And one of our options as a committee, so thank you for other counselors for indulging me and in, in talking with people and reporting back because one of our options is that we could have invited folks into this meeting um, to talk with all of us. And I was a little bit trying to avoid if we could um, kind of having an interview in a public meeting in that right. way, just um, right. so we had few enough applicants that felt doable. Um, any other thoughts before we take a vote? <laughs> okay, so the motion on the floor is for a positive recommendation on the appointment of Jonah Zuckerman to um, fill the position on the CPC. Um, Laura, would you call the roll? Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Great. Um, that passes um, with four votes. It is 612. Um, and that brings us to new business. And I'm okay with either um, considering our November meeting now. Um, if councillors, if you have thoughts under new business you'd like to contribute. Um, or if there are items you'd like to see on the agenda, um, you know, of, of course you can share that with me after the fact, but if there's any thoughts right now, especially if there's follow-up you'd like to see in November, um, we could discuss that now. Okay, you all did it. You are committee rock stars that we were able to, to get through quite an agenda today um, and still leave time in between now and legislative matters. So, so thank you so much for your work tonight. Such a, a pleasure to work with you all. And um, I guess that brings us to number eight on the agenda. I'll make a motion to adjourn then. Second it. Okay, <laughs> motion to adjourn uh, made by Councilor Perry, seconded by Councilor Labarge, no discussion on adjournment. Uh, Laura, if you could call the roll. Councilor Gore. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Perry. Yes. And Councilor Foster. Yes. Okay, so we are adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening. I'll Thanks. probably see you all very soon. Have a great night. Good night.